Perfect. Who here knows this company? Right? I hope I hope so. We pretty much use it all the time. Now, usually when I look up research, I really think about what is this researcher trying to get out of this? Because oftentimes you look at something and it might be like the Center for Creative Leadership. They do a big study and they tell you, well, creativity is number one. And you're like, that seems biased. You seem to have something behind that, right? Well, Google set out to figure out what makes the perfect team at Google. All they wanted to know was, what do we do to continue to replicate the teams that are the most effective, the most productive? And so I went, okay, this is important then. They don't care what the answer is. They just want to be able to replicate it over and over again. And so they did Project Aristotle. And what was really cool is when you have a company that size, they're able to do it over two entire years they invested in this. They did, what, 180 teams, 37,000 employees. That's a pretty thorough study of their teams. And you might think, oftentimes they thought it was going to be something like personality. Maybe it was that this person was extroversion, this person was openness to experience, conscientiousness, and when you combine those, you get this great team. But what they actually found was that the number one thing that determined what a good team was, productive, the effective ones, was psychological safety. Uh, Amy Edmondson started a research project on psychological safety when she was in a hospital. And what she found was she was very confused when she started her research. She said, what I found was that the best teams were actually the ones making the most mistakes. And she thought, that cannot be right. That makes no sense. Why are all these medical teams making mistakes, but they also have the best results? And what she found was they weren't making the most mistakes. They were talking about them openly every day. They were looking for how, what went wrong and what do we need to do to fix that? While the teams that weren't as productive were hiding those things because they didn't want to be seen as, oh, I messed that up. Right? So it's about how do we create an environment where everyone feels they can speak up, they're really heard and listen up, and then there's follow up. Something moves forward. The next one just says be curious. That's what it's about. Be curious. Be curious about what did that person experience? When they're sharing about their situation, be curious. What about it? Don't jump to all the assumptions and conclusions that you have from years of experience. Be there to be curious. And the last part about listening, be aware of the stories we tell ourselves. We all have these movies in our minds, these experiences. Every one of you have met clients, you've heard the client talk, and you think, oh, that's like that one over there, right? And you just you fill in all the blanks you need because you have experience. Be aware of that. Be aware of the stories we tell ourselves in those experiences and uh, the assumptions we make, the conclusions we make. Because when we're aware, we're able to actually say, okay, I need, to, I, need to, I need to hear more about that. Make sure that's what they're experiencing. Right? And so who remembers that there was one way to do math? You added, you had a right and wrong answer. Right? Okay, I was not in school that long ago, and that was still how it was. My fiance is a third grade teacher. What they teach kids are, here's a problem. Let's figure out how many ways we can solve it. Right? That's the new piece. Right? There's always different ways to solve things. And whenever you're wrong, right, we go in and they explore what was there. What didn't work right? What might you do next time to get it right? And so what they're looking at is that when we look at mistakes as wrong, and the word mistake has a very um, negative connotation automatically, right? Mistake, failure, those are already stigmatized as negative things. And when we create an environment where people feel that they can see life as a laboratory, this is about learning, growing, adapting, adding experiences, we create an entire different culture and environment. And the best example is right here. Okay, Raise your hand if you ever owned an Amazon Fire phone. I hope no one, because they didn't actually make it to market, really. And the reason was, they invested $170 million. Can you imagine investing $170 million into this phone and it failing? You spent $170 million in years of your life, and you were an employee, you were the director of this, and it failed. Can you imagine that? So they spent that money... They failed. After that meeting, right, because they decided to shut this project down at a big meeting with a bunch of the executives. And Jeff Bezos, the CEO, went to that person, his name was Ian Fried, and said, okay, Ian, you're going to go home tonight. You're going to be upset, and that's okay. But when you come back tomorrow, we're going to figure out what we can do with this project. You are safe here. Your job is safe here. Do not worry about this. I don't want you to think about this again. We're going to move forward. And it was, this is not a failure. This is a learning the Fire Phone wasn't for us. What's next? And the Fire Phone turned into Alexa and the Echo. 
and imagine the types of money and the products that they're creating off Amazon and Echo. That's what you get. When you don't create an environment where people are afraid to fail, when you actually create an environment where people feel that they can speak up, they can have ideas, they can innovate, they can think for themselves, and they can fail. And it's a safe failure. It's an intelligent failure. We don't fail on purpose in dumb failures, right? It's an intelligent failure. That's what we call it.